Good to see everyone out tonight. Thank you for, for being with us. Let me quickly give a pat on the back to, uh, to everybody who was able to help, help with, the, with the meal uh, for the Nipper family uh, this afternoon. Uh, as usual, there's plenty of food, and, uh, and they really did a, a really great job. I was thinking with the, the meetings tonight, we was gonna, we'd be in a real bind, but they've already got it cleaned up and everything. They've done a, done a fantastic job, and so a uh, pat on the back for all of them. Uh, the arrangements again for Sheila Rankin. The body is at Putnam Reed in Pikeville. They're visiting tomorrow, 4 to 8. That service is at 12 noon on Tuesday. They do not want a meal here at the church, but they said if, but if anyone wants to, they're not really asking for this, but if someone wants to take, a, a take something by the house, or even you could just leave it here and we'll get it to you. They live in Lee, get it to them. They, they live in Lee Station. If you, want to if you want to take a dish of some kind uh, for them after the service, it'll be fine. They don't want a big meal here at the church, so I'll, just to let you know that. Uh, let me mention Roy Pendergrass again. Uh, Roy, is going to, Roy and Carol are going to need lots, lots of prayers uh, over the next few weeks, prayers and support for them. And also Mr. Robert Baltimore, still, still struggling with the cancer on his head. Uh, prayers for them and all of our shut-ins. Uh, again, the elders' deacons meeting tonight, ladies' meeting tonight. Ladies' class is Tuesday night at 6 o'clock here at the building. Two gospel meetings, Sequatchie Valley with Steve Brown and Dunlap with Ben Vick. They both go through Thursday night. Both are at 7 o'clock. And don't forget the Friday night singing, which is this Friday here at the church building at 7 p.m. Tonight, Ryan Mosley is leading our song service. Willie is leading us, leading the opening prayer. Uh, presiding at the table is uh, Terry Don Hargis. The closing prayer will be led by Brad Pendergrass.
pray together, please. Our Father who out in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're thankful, Lord, for your love, your grace, your mercy. Lord, we know that we can never be good enough, Lord, to, to um, receive such a gift as heaven, Lord, but it's through your, your grace and your mercy that you gave us Jesus and and through him, Lord, that uh, we can put him on in baptism and wash away those sins. And, Lord, if we live a, a faithful life, that, that you, we can be up in heaven with you. Lord, we're, we're thankful for the life that, that Jesus lived for us. We're thankful that he, he is that conduit for, for prayer, and he's presenting our prayers to you. And, Lord, we just pray that we can live every day more and more like him. We just pray, Lord, that we can take his name and go out into this world and tell people and uh, not to be ashamed, not to be scared. Lord, we're thankful for the congregation that meets here, the, the Christians, Lord, that are here. We're, we're such a blessed area, such a blessed family here, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that we will continue to do good works and go out into this community and make a difference and be able to spread your word all up and down this valley and through the mountains and um, overseas into uh, those, uh, those ones who are going out into the, the missionary world, Lord, and pray that we're um, blessed those that we're supporting. Lord, so many in our congregation are hurting. It seems like we have lost some, um, some people lately, and it's just came at us pretty hard, and we just pray your blessing be on them, and Help them make it through this time and um, give them the comfort that they need, the support, Lord, to, to make it through. And we just pray everyone realizes how, how short this life can be. And we should take that example and make sure that our life is right with God, Lord, before it's just, it's just too late and we can't do anything about it. Lord, we're about to go into our week to, to work and to school and in different places and we just pray that you will protect us, that you will bless us, and pray that we'll be the right example to those that are around us, and take care of our kids testing this week, and just pray that they do, do really well, and we won't have any problems or, or issues with that. Lord, be with the sick, those who are struggling, those who are in the hospital, those who have cancer, dealing with illnesses, those who need surgeries or had surgeries and recovering, and just pray that you will you'll heal them and pray that they can get back to their normal walks of life. We just pray that you bless all the little kids here, the, the, the babies. And uh, we are so blessed in, um, at this congregation to, to have so many. We just pray, Lord, that you will protect them and they can grow up to, to be in, in your kingdom and, and work in your kingdom, Lord. We're thankful for Brother Keith, who's here, is going to bring a message to us here in just a minute, and we're thankful for his love for you and his love and willingness to share Jesus with, with the world, and we just pray that you'll bless him through this message today and this evening, and bless him and his family, Lord, as they do your work, and just pray that you'll protect them. Lord, forgive us of our sins, and when we fail, and just pray that we can put those mistakes behind us and not make them anymore. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So good to see everybody here tonight. Thank you, Ryan, for leading our songs. Thank you, Willie, for the prayer. Um, it's just it's such a blessing to um, be a member of the Bethel congregation. Everyone here is just so warm and uh, welcoming and loving, and, and I love how all of us love Jesus Christ and want to grow closer to Him uh, every day. Uh, if you want to take out your Bible with me and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 12, that's where we're going to be this evening, Romans chapter 12. Uh, we're continuing our Sunday night series in, uh, in Romans chapter 12 called uh, Living on the Altar. Um, as, as, we, as we look at God um, and as we uh, look at the book of Romans, we see, we have seen by our study through it, that God is a God of incredible mercy. The more that I fathom my sin, what I've done in the eyes of God. The, the more I understand God's holiness in relation to my sin. And, and, and the more that I comprehend and fathom the forgiveness, the weight of forgiveness that is offered to me through Jesus Christ, the more I understand those realities, the only reasonable, logical thing to do is to give everything. <laughs> the only thing that makes sense is to live a life on the altar of sacrifice as I comprehend ever more so this God, what He has done, who He is as revealed through Jesus Christ, what He has done for lost humanity. Humanity. That's, that's, that's Paul's point in Romans chapter 12. Uh, the, the Christian life, um, many people's approach to, to, to the Christian life is it's just kind of like fire insurance that you maintain by making sure you check all of your religious boxes off. But Paul's vision of Christianity in Romans chapter 12 is so different from that kind of perception of the Christian life, the Christian life is a life that has been and is being transformed by the mercies of God and lives, commits to live on the altar of sacrifice. And in our passage tonight that we're going to look at briefly together, in Romans chapter 12, we're, we're going to look at... Uh, we looked at the, the first half of this passage a couple weeks ago. We're going to look at the, the last half, um, verses 13 through 16 of Romans chapter 12. But Paul helps us to see what it specifically looks like to live life on the altar. What, what it looks like to um, live out the transformation that I have experienced through Jesus what it looks like to live out New Testament Christianity. Uh, so that's what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at verses 13 through uh, 16. And, and as we've, um, we, we've already looked at this uh, previously, he said, let, he said, let love be without hypocrisy. Um, and we just came up with a word that describes uh, the kind of attribute, the kind of character traits that God desires us as New Testament Christians to embrace. And we looked at uh, sincerity. Love, love uh, a, a New Testament Christian is, 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 is sincere. Uh, purity, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Loyalty, be fiercely loyal to one another as God is loyal to you and shows covenant steadfast love and faithfulness. Not lagging, verse 11, in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, urgency, and an urgent spirit uh, that, um, that, that embraces uh, t tenacity and, um, and, and urgency in the Christian life. And, uh, and then in verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continue, continuing steadfastly in prayer, positivity. Uh, so this is where we're going to pick up tonight, kind of a part two of what we talked about last, last, 
uh, last time, a couple of weeks ago. And that is starting in verse 13. So let's look closely at verse 13. So it says, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Now, a word that we can use to describe a character trait of New Testament Christianity is generosity. A New Testament Christian is one who is generous. And we see that the Bible teaches that at the core of a New Testament Christian, at, at, at the very center of, of, um, of his or her life and his or her heart, lies this conviction. What I have, the, the, the physical things that I have in this world, don't really belong to me. But rather, they belong to God who's given them to me to be a steward of them. What I have doesn't really belong to me. That kind of lies at the, that, that's a core conviction of a New Testament Christian as they approach their stuff, and the things that they have. And this kind of belief is intended to be a reflection of the very generosity of God. We see in Scripture that God is portrayed, God is presented as a very, very generous person. You look all the way in the, in, in, in the beginning. And really the story of, uh, of, of the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, the entire Old Testament is about a God who is generous <laughs> upon generous to a rebellious, stiff-necked, stubborn people and continues to show his generosity uh, to those that don't deserve it. And so us, as New Testament Christians, we are people who reflect that generosity of God. That's what we see in the very beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. Remember in verse 44, it says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So New Testament Christianity, what it means to live on the altar of sacrifice is, is to be generous toward our brothers and sisters in, in, in Jesus as God has been generous to us. And, and this takes a, a radical, radically different approach to life than what we were normally accustomed to before we came to Jesus Christ. What I have, the stuff that I have, it doesn't really belong to me. <laughs> we need to stand upon that belief. We need to stand upon that conviction as the, as, as the fuel that we need to be generous and to give as God has given to us. But note, also notice with me, there's a little bit different, there, there, there's another angle to a Christian's generosity. Uh, the, the first part here, Paul says, distributing to the needs of the saints. Paul commands us as New Testament Christians to be generous toward one another. But then he says, given to hospitality. This kind of comes at generosity at a little bit different angle. Uh, and you see that by looking at this, this original word rendered here hospitality that I want to camp out here uh, for, for a moment. The original Greek word rendered hospitality is philoxenia. Uh, and it's, it's a compound word in, in the original Greek. It's made up of two words uh, meaning love and outsider or stranger. Those two, the, the Greek word for love, which is uh, one of the Greek words, phileo, um, and zenea, to smash together to create this word hospitality. And, it's kind of, and we kind of do this in English. You know, we have words, we have, we have two different words that are smashed together like firefighter, um, notebook, um, superhero, you know, some, something like that. So hospitality when we attempt to understand it, what it means, it means a love for strangers, a love for outsiders. That's what hospitality means. And 
It makes me think of Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 2. The Hebrew writer says at the end of the epistle there in, uh, in verse 1, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show, here's this word, hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Now, when I was a kid and I read that verse and I approached it, I, I thought, you know, I, I, I used it in, in terms of, you know, if I, if I saw a hitchhiker out on the street, I better do something about it. I better pick him up because he might be an angel. And I, better, I, might, uh, I might need to help him, help him out. Um, but in, in that, you know, that, we could very well apply it that way. But really, the idea of hospitality, um, as we see within this text, it has to do with all strangers, all kinds of strangers, e- even those who are strange to the faith of Jesus Christ, those who are lost. Be generous, love those who are outside of the faith of Jesus Christ. That's New Testament Christianity. It's a love for strangers, an intense passion and zeal and love for those who don't have what you have. Those who are outside of the faith of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you look in other places of the Bible, you look in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and Titus chapter 1, verse 8. This word hospitality, it's also listed as a qualification for an elder, which shows us how very important this attribute is. Of, of a Christian because um, it's, it, it's important for church leadership to possess a love for strangers because it's church leadership that sets the tone for the rest of the congregation. Uh, and I am just so glad that we have elders um, that uh, love strangers, uh, that want to show um, love to outsiders, those outside of the faith of Jesus Christ. So it begs the question, uh, as we approach this practically, do you love outsiders? Do you love those outside of the faith of Jesus Christ? Do you love the lost? Because at the core of a New Testament Christian, it, it lies a passion for those who don't know Jesus, a passion for those who don't have what you have because that passion is an imitation of Jesus himself who has that passion for lost people. So with all that being said, what does living on the altar look like? What does New Testament Christianity look like? New Testament Christianity is generous, both to those inside the faith and Outside. That's what New Testament Christianity looks like in practice. Okay, let's go on to verse uh, 14 here. He says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this point because he talks about, he, he fleshes this idea out more so in the following verses. And, and we're going to look at that next time. Uh, but I'll, I'll just say, you know, this is, I believe that this is one of the hardest things uh, that we're tasked to do as New Testament Christians. To bless those who persecute you. To bless and do not curse. Because our natural instinct is to do the very opposite of that. But the, the, but, but the reason for which we bless those who persecute you is because that's the treatment that we have received through Jesus Christ. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So that's New Testament Christianity, a desire to a willingness to bless those, even those that don't want me to be blessed. 
Okay, let's continue on. Let's look at verse 15. Paul says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Oh, what, what's a word that we could use? Empathy. Empath empathy. Sharing the feelings of another person. Actively and consciously putting yourself in the shoes of another person as an expression of love. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, he uses this same idea here uh, when he talks about the church. In verse 26, he says, If one member suffers, and he's, he's talking about the church as the body, the church is the body of Christ. He's using the body as an analogy for the church. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So Paul uses this idea of the body to teach that the physical body is interconnected. It has different members that all contribute to the body's overall functioning. And the logic here is that when one part of the body is well, the other parts rejoice because that other part is well. The, 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 when, when, you're, when your left hand is feeling good and you, you know, your arthritis isn't kicking up or whatever, and your, your, your right arm isn't going to be envious or jealous of your, of, your, of your left hand. Because why? Because they're interconnected with one another. And, and, when, and likewise, when one part is not well... When one, of the, when one part of the body is not well, the other parts, what do they do? They give active help, active aid to make that part well. You know, that's the logic within the passage because the body itself is interconnected. And Paul's point here is that the church is like a body in that way. We, we, don't, we don't live inside of our little bubble uh, but rather we actively try to place ourselves in the shoes of other people. And that's how we show love. We practice empathy in that way. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. Remember the story of Jesus raising Lazarus in John chapter 11? Remember this? One of the, one of the most famous uh, verses, because it's the shortest, <laughs> in John chapter 11 Verse 35, what does that say? Jesus wept, yeah. At the sight of all of those whom he loved gathered around Lazarus' tomb, weeping for their deceased loved one. And, and what, what's so fascinating about this story is that, you know, why would Jesus weep? <laughs> what is the point of Jesus weeping at all? Uh, when he when when he comes to the when he comes to the tomb here, I mean, he had the power to solve the problem. He had the power to heal him and raise him from the dead. And, and what's interesting is that he did, and he he know he he knew that he had the ability to, and he did exercise his ability to raise Lazarus from the dead. So why the weeping? What's the point of Jesus expressing emotion in this way, he wept because he was practicing empathy. He committed to putting himself in the shoes of another person and feeling with those whom he loved what they feel as an expression of love. That's how we express love to one another. We rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. And that's what Jesus continues to do for us. That's what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. He says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have, I love this passage, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help 
in time of need. Jesus Christ is the master empathizer. God himself places himself in your experience. God himself has become human. And since he has become human, he knows your plight. He knows exactly how you feel and uses that in a way to express love. And we as his followers attempt to do the same. We attempt to empathize with one another, place ourselves in the shoes of each other and feel what other people are feeling, grieve with each other, weep with each other, rejoice with each other. And this is really hard sometimes because sometimes people are just frustrating. (laughs) Uh, You mean they're doing it again? Again? You've got to be kidding me. Well, just remember how patient God has been with you. Through your, through your failings and your shortcomings. And that will give you the power to empathize and practice this kind of spiritual discipline. All right, let's move on and look at the last one tonight. Uh, look with me in verse 16. Paul says this, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Uh, What's a word that we could use? Impartiality. A Christian is impartial in their disposition toward other Christians and the rest of the world. So Paul says, having one mind, the same mind. And this, this word toward is key here. Be of the same mind toward one another. Um, He's not just telling us to to have the same doctrine, um, although that's a very true Christian principle. Um, We need to be one in the faith in the sense that we adhere to the same teachings uh, and, um, and, and strive to be one mind in that way. But that's not really the idea that Paul's trying to communicate in, in, in this passage. Having the same mind toward one another in this way, it means that we place the same level of value on every human being that we see. That's what he's, that's what he's meaning here. He, he's meaning that we don't, we don't determine each other's value based upon appearances, based upon the way people look, based upon the clothes that people wear, based upon how much another person has. We have one mind toward everyone, a, a mind that sees all people as valuable enough for God to die for. And, that, and that's why we, we can see that this is true as you keep reading. He says, do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Associate with the the humble, or, or also translated as lowly. And this is really the idea that James talks about in James chapter 2. If you want to turn with me there, James chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. James says in James chapter 2, starting in verse 1, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings... In fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes. And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And then he says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who loved him? In in, in other words, James is saying, if you don't have one mind in this way toward everyone, but uh, but you see some as more valuable than others and 
cater to people based upon appearances, based upon what they can give back to you, then you're operating the exact opposite way that God himself operates who sees people with seemingly little value on the surface from a human perspective as immensely, immensely valuable. James says don't show partiality in that way, but have the same kind of a mind that's directed toward each and every person. A kind of mind that sees people as valuable enough for God to give his life for. That's New Testament Christianity. That's having one mind toward one another. Even those who don't seem on the surface like they have much value, the lowly, the humble, associate with those and see those people as immensely valuable. Um, Last passage tonight. I think this is applicable to this point here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new Man from the two, thus making peace. So God, uh, Paul here, he t- he's talking about Jew and Gentile coming together because of Jesus Christ as a new man, as a new kind of humanity. Um, from people that had different backgrounds, people that came from different cultures, now become one together. In Jesus Christ. That, that's, that's the gospel. That's the gospel in action. When two people, two groups of people that have nothing in common, and not only nothing in common, but who were once at enmity with one another, surrender their pride, surrender, to the foot of the, surrender at the foot of the cross, and now become together one new man, a new kind of human a new kind of human being. So God's vision of church, as we see in this passage, when people look at it from the outside, is that they will have no explanation for this group to be together, for this group of people to be together, except for Jesus Christ. People that have virtually nothing in common. (laughs) Old, young, uh, Male, female, black, white, Jew, Gentile, from all different kinds of of groups and backgrounds coming together who have now everything in common. And what keeps that kind of supernatural unity going is exactly what we're talking about in this lesson tonight. It's having this same mind toward one another. Even someone that's different than me. Even someone that comes from Timbuktu <laughs> uh, or, or somewhere that, that, is, that, is, that I'm not familiar with. Seeing that person as immensely valuable. So we can see that New Testament Christianity is so much more uh, than fire insurance. <laughs> it's so much more than checking off boxes Uh, The nuts and bolts of New Testament Christianity is imitating Jesus Christ. And and you notice we reference Jesus uh, a lot in this lesson. Jesus is the one who does all of these things. And we as New Testament Christians imitate him. And that's what it means. That's what it means. And that's what it looks like specifically to live on the altar. Tonight, if anyone has need, uh, the lesson is yours. If anyone needs to respond to the gospel call uh, tonight, please come forward and uh, repent of your sins, believe on Jesus, and confess faith in Him, and be immersed in the waters of baptism and begin a relationship with Him. Come forward tonight if you have any need as we stand and as we sing.
Is anyone here that has not had the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper and you need a communion kit? If you'll raise your hand, we'll get you one. Okay. If you'll remove the cellophane wrap and then do the unleavened bread. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Our God and our Father, we're thankful for this day and the wonderful blessings that you bless us with. Father, be with those now who partake of this loaf, which to us is the body of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. May those who partake of it do so in a way that's well pleasing with thee. If you'll remove the other foil to get to the wine or the fruit of the vine, let's go to our Heavenly Father. In like manner, Heavenly Father, we offer thanks for this fruit of the vine, which is the shed blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. And may those who take, partake of it do so in a way that's well pleasing with thee. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're again thankful that you've allowed us to join together here tonight to hear another message that Brother Keith has brought to us. We're thankful for the message that he brought us this morning. And we ask that, Father, that we could take these messages and add them to our lives so that we can bring others to thee. Father, we're again thankful for all the blessings that you blessed us with while we are here on this earth. And we ask that if it be thy will to continue to bless us means you had in the past. Father, there's so many on the that we mentioned of being sick that need our prayers, those that are going through surgeries, treatments, those that are just sick and shut in in the nursing homes. We ask, Father, that you'd be with the caregivers and that if it be your will that they would return back to their original state of health as quickly as possible. Father, we ask again that you be with the ones that have lost loved ones this week and last week and this month, this year. We ask that you continue to bless them and comfort them during this trying time. Father, we ask that as we're about to depart that you would go with each of us Help us to have safe commutes to and from our jobs throughout the week so we can return here on Wednesday night and again next Sunday. Father, we ask that you continue to guide, guard, direct us, continue forgiving us for our sins, and continue to allow us to share the health and happiness we share in our families. All these blessings we ask in Christ's name. Amen.